So now that you live out of Mississippi, what does it what does it feel like when you come back? Home? Yes. That's a Did, very well, complicated question. I still call it home because okay. you carry, as as I said, yeah. if you if you're born in a place like Mississippi, yeah. it lives in your heart. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, just it lives in your heart. I mean, you you can escape it at any age, but and I say escape, I'm, and I use words very carefully. Sure. I didn't move away. I escaped mm -hmm. uh, because you know I was a little gay boy, mm -hmm. and you know it's still not accepted that right. well here. Well, so you must come back here with a certain amount of strength that you've gained in your adulthood. Mm -hmm. It seems um, like... If I come back as a strong adult, mm -hmm. I'm back here for three days and I'm back being the insecure Missi okay. Mississippi sissy. That's yeah. why I'm sort of good for three days here. Uh -huh. And then I revert <laughs> back. I think we always revert back to who we are as kids if we go back home. Mm -hmm. You know, we finally sort of become that person all over again. You know, we try to, try to uh, mask all that stuff as we get older. But if we go back to our parents or our sisters or brothers or where we went to school mm -hmm. uh, as little kids, I think we just revert right back to that person, yeah. you know, that little kernel of who we are. Right. You know? mm -hmm. There's one more thing I absolutely mm -hmm. have to ask you mm -hmm. about, and it's your father's secret. Mm -hmm. the whole, when I was reading the book... You thought he molested me, didn't you? No. No. Because okay. no, I, I, I think that's what people think as they're reading, like, what's the secret? What's the secret? Well, it's because mm -hmm. you say things, you say yeah. something touching your leg. Right, yeah. And right, maybe that's right, misleading, right, but right. that's not what I thought. Okay, okay. Um, you kept mentioning it, and right. I kept wanting to know what, the what it was. That's and the whole each, point. I know, but each time <laughs> you'd give, like, a little morsel. Right, yeah. Um, but I was surprised, actually, when you decided right. to give it away. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like when you gave up that secret, because you, you called secrets like a source of comfort. Right. Mm -hmm. you, right. felt, you felt in your comfort zone well, you, when you it's a, it. It, it, was a, it was a source of power. Okay. Not comfort, okay. power. Power. If you, if you know someone else's secret, yes. you're powerful, you know? I mean, they say in 12 steps you're only as sick as your secrets. Uh, okay. But if... You have, if you know someone else's secrets, it gives you a certain sort of power, mm -hmm. you know, over them. So that scene in my house, I knew my mama's secret, I knew my daddy's secret, right. I knew my own secret, and I knew I was the only one who knew all those secrets. Yeah. So that I was the powerful one, even though I was six. Mm -hmm. And I told the secret about my father, and the precise moment in the book, we had a big discussion, my 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 uh, editor and I about, I should have told the secret earlier, but. It was very important for me to tell the secret when I was molested by the preacher mm -hmm. because what my father gave me in that secret that he gave me, I won't give it away, you'll have, have to read the book, was complicity. Mm -hmm. Well, no, so with the secret you mentioned that that was sort of your connection to your father. Mm -hmm. d um, did telling the secret, mm -hmm. uh, w did that change anything about how you feel? About my father now that I've told it as an adult? Because I've never told it until this book. Well, and I believe yeah, you, but yeah. I mean, did it change any any sort of yeah. connection you felt like you had? Yeah. Did it change my relationship with my father now that he's, I mean, um, well, he's been dead since I was seven. Mm -hmm. um, so, but that doesn't mean that your relationship doesn't evolve even with dead people, mm -hmm. you know? Um, even when someone dies, you're still sort of processing who they are and what they were and what, what they meant, what they meant to you. Um, I, I hope that, I, I believe when someone dies, because I've had to deal with death all my life, you know, it was the third tit, you know, it was like a source of nourishment in, in a strange way in my life. And um, you become part of God's omniscience. That's sort of what I believe uh, my idea of heaven is, knowledge. Mm. That you become part of God's knowledge. So that if that's true, I sort of think my father knows I've told the secret now, you know, right. and I hope within God's knowledge he can be, he can forgive me, but if you believe in God, then forgiveness is part of what God is. That was the only guilty thing I had about the whole book. Okay. Was and I telling wondered, that secret. it's interesting that Cause, you cause, said guilt. Yeah, I have felt a little guilty about telling that. I've kept it all my life, mm -hmm. you know, I sort mm -hmm. of kept that little secret all my life. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I see. I mean, I'll tell anything about me, sort of, and you know. Mm -hmm. But um, I sort of felt a little guilty about that. So I hope my father understands the use of him in that passage. Okay. You know, so. Well, do you want to say anything about Frank? Tell us something we don't know. Frank Haynes. Mm -hmm. Well, he used. He was an amazing uh, Renaissance man in Mississippi. Um, gentle, erudite, 
um, amazing, amazing person. He, he was the arts editor of the Jackson Daily News, which is now defunct. Um, he was a set designer. He was an amazing writer and critic. Uh, he was Eudora Welty's best friend. Mm -hmm. That's when I, you know, they sort of cut me out of the herd when I was about um, 15, 16. And I became their little mascot with a shag haircut. And I was, you know, just, um, it was, it was an amazing time. It was sort of a halcyon era in Jackson of this literate, sort of worldly sophisticated group of people all around Miss Welty when she was like in her late 50s and 60s. Mm. And uh, it was Frank and the girls. You know? right. And the girls would always come over and you know, they'd, she'd drink her Maker's Mark and I'd pour the Maker's Mark mm. and they'd sit around Frank's big kitchen table and he'd cook. And, and I just sat there and was so thankful that um, I was a teenage, a teenager sitting mm. at this table trying to, you know, soak all this in. It dawned on me when, when I started writing this book that when I moved to New York and first tried to be an actor and stuff, uh, and that didn't pan out finally, then I started this journalistic career where I ended up interviewing people. And I realized that's a lot of what Frank did, that Frank, you know, interviewed people all the time and wrote about the arts, and, and I sort of lived out his life for him. You know? And when I went back to Mississippi to dig up the, um, when I came back here, when I first started the book, the last part of the book was going to be all about the murder trial, and so I had to dig out all the transcripts of the of the trial because they said they didn't have them. I had to go in and find the microfilm and you know convince them to let me take them out of the chantry clerk's office and copy them, and because uh, they said they didn't have them, I had to really dig around and find them. So I was proud of myself for finding them, and then I went to the uh, Mississippi archives and found their file on Frank and the, and the murder. And I had a herringbone coat on, and I had my uh, big black glasses on like this, mm -hmm. and I'm bald. And when I left at 19, when he was murdered, I didn't wear glasses, I would never wear a herringbone coat, mm -hmm. and I had a shag haircut. Mm -hmm. And I opened up the file on Frank, and the huge picture of the banner headline, first there was, at the top, there was the founder of Piney Wood School died that same day. I forgot what his name was, but this legendary educator here from the Piney Wood School. Underneath that was a huge picture of Frank with Frank Haynes murdered. And like, you know, my finding him, you know, bound and gagged and the back of his head gone and the brain spilling out and everything. But in his picture, he had a herringbone coat on, he had glasses like this, and he's bald. Mm -hmm. And I was staring at, I had become Frank. Yeah. It was the oddest, oddest thing. Mm -hmm. And when I was reading, I had to constantly remind myself that these aren't characters. I would right, say, right. I love this character, right, like Maddie right. May, but right. they're well, not she's, characters. She's, but sort of, she's sort of the heroine of, of the book. In fact, yeah. you know, she references Sidney Poitier over mm -hmm. and over in the book as like sort of a mantra. I mean, she, mm -hmm. she, it becomes a mantra for her. You know, mm -hmm. it's just Poitier, Poitier, Poitier. That's Maddie May became my mantra, mm -hmm. Maddie May, Maddie May, Maddie May. And every year that I have a niece or a nephew who graduates from high school, I become Auntie Mame, and I take them to Los Angeles for Oscar weekend. And I take them to the CAA party. Uh, my friend Brian Lord, who's the head of CAA, and all the movie stars are there you know, at this private party. Then I take them to Barry Diller and Diamond Dion Furstenberg's picnic, mm -hmm. and then I take them to the Vandy Fair Oscar party. So they get to see sort of my Cinderella life. You know? And I give them three days that they'll always mm -hmm. remember as sort of, you know, so they can name drop like their Uncle Kevin. <laughs> and so we were at the picnic. My last nephew that graduated Price, we went to the picnic, and we went to get our food, and one picnic table over was Sidney Poitier. Get out. No, really. And, I th and my book was just coming out that month. Yeah. And I said, you know what? This is the universe. Price, I've got to go introduce myself to Sidney Poitier. So I went and knelt at his side, and I said, Mr. Poitier, I've written this book called Mississippi Sissy. And you're a big part of it, and let me tell you why. And I began to tell him the story of Maddie Mae. And in the middle of it, I think it was Penny Marshall of all people, came over <laughs> to kiss him hi. Mm -hmm. And so I got up to like, you know, leave and let them talk. And he grabbed my hand, he said, no, don't leave. I want to hear about Maddie Mae. Oh, that's amazing. So I sat at his feet, and for the next 15 minutes, I told him all about Maddie Mae. Mm -hmm. And I really felt her press, like she had waited all these years, whatever time means in heaven. She had, maybe it was a second to mm -hmm. her, I don't know. 
But she had waited all this time to sort of lead me to that spot in Los Angeles, in Beverly Hills, at a picnic table, mm -hmm. at Sidney Poitier's feet, so I could tell him about her. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, in his moment sometime when he's in a reverie, he can think about that little bald guy that sat at my feet during Oscar weekend and think about Maddie Mae, and maybe he can go, Maddie Mae, Maddie Mae, Maddie Mae. Mm -hmm. you know? so, anyway. That's so great. Yeah. Do you have any, anything else you want to say? I think I said enough. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be 10 minutes. No, excuse me. This is going to be 10 minutes. <laughs> well, thank you for okay. being with us on right. Don't Lecture Me. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you.